All right, Jason. Uh, Holcim, the leading construction material company in the world, has recently signed multi-year purchase agreements on green construction materials based on relatively unproven technologies. Why? Yeah, you're hitting me with a hard-hitting question right away. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you talked a little bit about us as a company, building materials manufacturer, biggest in the world, and we operate also in the cement industry. And you know the cement industry has a pretty big emissions problem. We, as an industry, are responsible for about 8% of all global emissions, and we need solutions to reduce that problem because there is pressure on us from demand but also from the supply side, and we have a lack of solutions to do that. So we need to take risks, we're willing to take risks, and those offtake agreements are a very great way to do that. You mentioned that cement is responsible for 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. and uh, just for, for context, the reason why that is the case is because we make so much of cement. We make roughly 4 billion tons of cement every year, which goes into 30 to 50 billion tons of concrete every year, which is the most manufactured material on Earth uh, after water. But, and, and most of the emissions are coming from the cement. Yes. Why? What's the problem? Yeah, so there are two big emission factors to, to cement. One comes from the fuel and one comes from the process emission. So to make cement, you take a feedstock, limestone most of the time, and you need to break away the CO2 molecule to give it its binding properties. To do that, the traditional cement making process runs at about 1450 degrees up to 1800 degrees Celsius in some, uh, some areas. And for that, you need fuel. So traditionally, that's natural gas, coal, pet coke, a lot of, let's say, uh, dirty fuels, um, which make about 40% of the emissions of the, um, of the material. The 60% of uh, emissions come from breaking away the CO2 molecule, because with that, the CO2 just goes into the air. So that makes about 60% of those 8 million tons per year. Exactly. I think this is a really interesting uh, point for people to understand who are not familiar with, with the cement industry. If you, so, so the main raw material for traditional cement is limestone. And limestone practically is calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate, for the ones who remember some of their high school chemistry, is a combination of calcium oxide and CO2. So literally, when you bring the raw material into the oven, the kiln, you put it into such a high temperature that you lose half of the mass into the air as CO2. Unless you capture it. Unless you capture it. Exactly. Yes. So what do you think about carbon capture as a solution? Um, I always like to think of it as a band-aid solution, as if you find better ways to just abate the carbon in, in general, why would you try to, to capture it? But given the pressures on our industry from a regulatory side, it's a necessity. So that's why also uh, we're getting support uh, to develop these carbon capture projects all across Europe. So it is a reality, it will happen. Um, but if you can find technologies to avoid that in general, I think that's the better way to go. Exactly. And so for historically, given that cement is such a huge industry, though an essential one, it forms the basis for all of our infrastructure, all of our buildings, you could say that you guys have been historically part of the problem, mm -hmm. right? Why would you change now? What, what makes now so special? Yeah, so I mean, I talked in the, in the beginning a little bit about supply side pressure, demand side pressure. So on the supply side, especially in, in the EU, we have the emissions trading scheme. So there are credit allowances, and at some point, that has a pretty, pretty big effect on the cement industry. So this is a regulatory pressure that basically drives all the pressure on the supply side and forces us just to uh, reduce our carbon balance, not to go bankrupt. Because if the cement industry operates the way it does today and the emission trading scheme plays out the way it does, then there will be no cement industry. And that's why we do carbon capture. On the demand side, we also see a bunch of shifts in, in buying behavior. So uh, tech companies, government authorities, yeah, public procurement, they're asking us for lower carbon products, and they're preferentially asking for that, and that gives you and the, let's say, the player in the industry that can deliver that a competitive edge. So we really have 
pressure from both sides to to come up with some solutions on that end. Exactly. And what what you what we have heard when when talking to different players around the construction material value chain is that it has gotten to the point, especially in some European countries, where if you as a cement maker or a concrete or a construction company cannot make a bid on these construction projects with materials that is low enough on, on carbon, you're not even in the race. Oh. You can't even bid, and let yes. alone win a bid. Yeah, especially, uh, especially in the, uh, let's say, for, for public contracts, that's the case. Yeah. In some forward-thinking, uh, say, government contracts, you can tender with a traditional cement product or a concrete product, and you'll basically be excluded from the tender or just not win it. So it is a really a competitive advantage. And we can, let's say, improve that competitive advantage as a company if we work together with technology companies that help us deliver the solutions I was talking about. And I mean, that's what you're doing for us, but it's really hard. So you're trying to scale up, you're trying to help us solve that problem. So maybe you can tell us how that works and what's, why so hard. <laughs> yeah. So on, on, on a very big picture scheme, by the way, the spinning is really wild. Yeah, it's I have cool. To say. <laughs> uh, in, if, you, if you look at what happens in our process in contrast with the traditional cement making process, where traditionally when you make cement, you bring in roughly two tons of, of limestone, you burn it, half of it goes into the air and you're left with, with half of it, which is reactive. We run a different process. So <clears throat> What we do is we actually take as a starting point, as one factor of our production, is CO2 that has been captured already from the air, from the ocean, or from industrial emissions. And we put that CO2 into a chemical reactor. We put some water and we put another type of rock uh, into the reactor as well. And we have chemistry going on in the process where the CO2 reacts with the rock that we put in, gets bound into it, so you get out a mineral product that behaves a little bit like cement, mm -hmm. but is made out of CO2 partly. Now, the interesting thing is that the, the chemistry that all of this is based on is not our invention. It was invented by nature. Every single year around the planet, roughly one billion tons of CO2 already gets pulled down from the air by rock surfaces that you find everywhere on the, on the planet. But it happens really, really slowly. It's a geological process. So, what, what we do and where our proprietary technology lies is in accelerating that chemistry by a factor of roughly 10 million and exerting a lot of control over what the output product looks like so that it can actually be a good either cement, partial cement substitute or another component in, in concrete. Now, even though the chemistry is known, this is still a process and uh, a technology that has not been scaled up before. So you start from the lab, and then you work your way up stage by stage. So you first, you have a tiny gram scale uh, reactor. Then you go to a bench scale reactor, which is like a big milk carton, roughly. Um, then you go up to a pilot scale reactor. We've been running ours for, for the last year now, which is a 500 liter big pressure cooker, if you, if you will. It's so Obelix, right? It's, it's called Obelix, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Our small one is Asterix, and the big one is called Obelix for the European ones who read that comic uh, back in the day. Now, the... Interesting thing is when, when you're making a process, a new process, ready to be scaled up, to be an industrial reality, uh, you typically want to have a so-called continuous process. Mm -hmm. So you want, instead of a batch process, where you put everything into the glass, you close the lid, create your reaction conditions, remove the lid, take the stuff out, and then if you want to use the reactor again, you have to go through the same cycle again. It's not very scalable, it's not capital efficient, it's not space efficient, um, and it usually you lose a lot of OPEX uh, efficiency in the process as well. So you want to move to a place where you have continuous inflow, continuous reaction, and continuous outflow. So we've been working on that for the past year, and we're just, uh, just finalizing the, the construction of our demonstration plant in, in Rotterdam. And what makes, and of course, the next step after that is bringing this to the commercial scale. You build a commercial scale facility that actually produces hundreds of thousands of tons of this product or more and ships those to, to customers. Yeah. And <clears throat> really, the so yes, there's advanced engineering involved in getting this done, but really the tricky part in this is that it takes time. Yes. It takes time to move from one stage to the other, make sure that you understand what happens between those different stages, and you're dealing with real life things like equipment lead times. Yeah, you need to build stuff. Exactly, to build stuff. I mean, we're, we're not making every single piece of metal ourselves in our own workshop. 
we're mostly basing the technology on off-the-shelf equipment that we put together in a new way, just like, like the iPhone, and uh, though much bigger and much, yeah, some say more beautiful, some say maybe uglier, but um, that's, that's the reality. So you have to do engineering, which makes sure that the installation is safe, you have to procure equipment, takes time, yeah. then you have to install it, you have to test it, and then you can start running it and optimizing it, and all of this takes time. And then when you start building uh, e even demo plants, but even bigger plants, you get things like permitting. Where are you even allowed to build up new industry or build a new operation on an existing industrial site? All of that takes, takes time. Yes. Attracting talent is not hard. Uh, so far, we've been able to finance the, finance the company also, thanks to my much smarter co-founder, Marta, who's <laughs> sitting there in the audience. <laughs> um, yeah, and, I mean, uh, it sounds pretty difficult. I mean, if I, if I to put it in layman terms, you just put CO2 into rocks. But I yeah. mean, there's a lot more and a lot complicated, many complicated things on the technical side just for that too. Now, what, after you've solved all of those problems, the material needs to be sold to someone, right? Yeah. And construction is a regulated market. There are many players in there. And there's a value chain you need to address. And if, I think you did that quite well, bringing in different parties. Yeah. How do you, th how do you see it, the demand side for you guys? Where, and how are you going to solve that problem? Yeah. So first, when we started the company, we didn't start with <clears throat> knowing that we're going to go into the construction industry. We started from under, like trying to figure out what to do with all the CO2 that we have to capture and make it into something useful. The construction industry was the natural application area because of the volumes involved and because of being able to generate permanent carbon storage uh, for, the, for the carbon that we have turned into a material. Now, um, when we realized that, okay, construction industry it is, we needed to understand the industry. Like, who's there? What are the different players in the value chain? So after us, you have cement companies, you have concrete companies, you have construction companies, you have real estate development and investment firms, you have the ultimate asset owners, which can be people like Amazon who own data centers, they could be city governments or national governments who own infrastructure or public buildings. And so we spoke to all parts of that value chain just to understand who wants to transition mm -hmm. and what are they willing to do to make that transition happen. But what became very clear very quickly is that the shift from the current way of building to a, an actually sustainable carbon storing way of building is not going to happen unless you bring the entire value chain along for the ride. So we did um, what uh, Spotify did in the, in the music industry, which is you bring, you bring the value chain along for the ride and you align incentives. You create shared upside for everyone involved um, in, in the project. So on our Series A last summer, we, we had you guys uh, join in out of the big cement majors. We took uh, Amazon, yeah, their climate pledge fund, uh, who wants to decarbonize how they built whatever they built. And we took uh, a leading European uh, construction and concrete company called Goldbeck as, as well. And now there is a common ground to start discussing and figuring out, well, how do we actually deploy this material and put it out into the real world? Mm -hmm. And I think folks don't appreciate how hard that is because us having that discussion as a material manufacturer as part of the value chain is very hard to end up with the actual building owner because you have to go through all these different steps. We as a construction company, uh, as a materials company, need to make money on the product. There needs to be margin, it needs to be scalable in, in manufacturing. Then it goes to the contractor, he needs to be able to work with it on site. How easy it is, is it to pour? Construction industry doesn't have really high margin, so every minute they lose on the job site is lost money. They're not really willing to make any compromises there. And then the actual building owner needs to take the decision on specifying a material that then is more low carbon because it works with their incentives. At its material manufacturer only, it's a hard conversation to have. So out of the partnership, we appreciate having that conversation with this entire value chain to actually be able to, to make it happen in the end. Because it's, it's not that easy and it's not as easy as, as done. Yeah, and I think, of course, for us, the added upside is the fact that we have, in addition to only having a cement major like you guys on the cap table, when we also have one of your customers on the same cap table and at the same discussion table, you guys have to play nice as well because you, you want to keep uh, companies like Amazon happy. So that, that works. But it has led to uh, some shared projects already, which would not have happened as quickly 
real field scale deployments and projects of, with this material would not have happened if it wasn't for the shared incentives uh, at, the, at the same uh, table. Yeah, and you said uh, we need to play nice. <laughs> this is a little bit of a David and Goliath situation for you guys also in terms of how to go to market and to compete with and so on. Yeah. So when you took the decision to partner with us, both on the equity even now also on the, on the commercial side, mm. what, made you, what made you comfortable? Um, well, for us, we know the, the material that we are making can be easily combined with traditional cement. So you can make the transition gradual for the construction industry to turn, hopefully over time, more and more carbon storing. For us, the decision to work with, uh, work with you guys was related to a few different things. Uh, one of them was that um, you can be a huge customer for us. And if instead of going to a 35 different concrete manufacturers, we may be able to go to you and get the same volume agreement sold. And in fact, this is one of the, one of the most interesting uh, kind of side effects or outcomes that, that we have on, on the table and as a discussion with you guys, which is these off-take agreements. Mm -hmm. So to, to really de-risk and make the scaling up of this process possible, you need to work with your customers. So we, we are in a conversation around within what conditions would you buy a very large amount of this material produced by a plant that doesn't exist yet, right? Which is the, the playbook that now has been pioneered by some of the, for example, Swedish clean tech pioneers, Northvolt for batteries, uh, H degree steel or Stegra for, for steel right now, where the structure is essentially one where you, as a large buyer, have an interest in securing access to a certain amount of a green, green commodity. And you're willing to commit that if we produce this material with these technical properties, uh, at these volumes, at these time frames, you will buy it at this particular price. And we can go into more detail on, on that in a, in a second. But of course, the second thing is that whenever you're bringing a new material to the market, there are checks and balances in place. It's always a regulatory process that you, that you need to go through, because whatever we bring to the market, we need to know it's safe and it's going to last if we're going to build something out of it. So navigating that whole process of how to make this product widely accepted across the different markets is something where we can learn so much from you and work together with you guys on uh, to just make it available for the, for the bigger audience. And of course, as, as a final thing for us, if you, if you think about what needs to happen for us after we have produced the material, it needs to go to the market. Not only does it need to go to the, to the next buyer, but then to the final customers. So by you guys buying a big chunk of our product, you're essentially handling our distribution at the same time. Through there are probably a lot more areas where right. we can go into as well. Yeah, but you were you're already referencing kind of the offtake agreements, yeah. right? And for you now, in the next stage of scaling up, you're talking about first of a kind plans. Yeah. We, we throw that word around quite a bit. Um, what do you think that first of a kind plant needs to look like for you guys? What are you trying to achieve? And how does offtake kind of play into that? Yeah. So whenever you're scaling up a new process, you need to demonstrate on different scales that it actually works and that the, the operating costs and the capital costs are roughly what you expected it to be so that you can make sure that there is a business case. right? So the, the real kind of choke point for many hard tech and deep tech companies when they're, when they're about to scale up is the first commercial scale production facility, where the, the trickiness is the fact that this technology has not been scaled up before. No one has built a plant like this before. So there is no blueprint, there is no playbook for how to build it, uh, avoiding you know, the different potholes that you find along the way when you supersize a, a process equipment and, and run, build and run an entire operation around it. So there's a lot of risk involved in building the first commercial scale facility. Now, to even build that plant, you need to make sure that there is some demand for the product that you're going to be making. And there, the, the concept of an off agreement, having secured a certain sizable amount of demand for the total production capacity, comes in. But maybe I may, I may even uh, turn it around to, to you guys. So, when we sign an off agreement with, uh, with someone like you, what is important in that off agreement? What do you care about? 
Because you're also taking some risk. We're also, t or we're, are you? We're taking risk. Um, depends on how you structure it. Yeah. But um, no, we do take a, take a bit of risk, but we're happy to take the risk to gain a competitive advantage out of it, right? That's why that's our thinking behind it. So we do these offtake agreements to bring a material to market, to see how our customers react, to see how we can work with it, and at some point have first access to it because we've already been working with you and so on. So the way we like to structure these things, and this is, I think it's an industry or, or it's a field that is still in, in early days, so everyone's still learning with this, but in the end it needs to make commercial sense for us in a sense. So either we have a margin on the product already, or there's some, something else we can take out of it. What is important is that we have product specs. How is the product going to look like chemically? Does it adhere to standards? Can we already sell it in, in the mass market based on the current standards, or is there some special standard that um, needs to apply? What is the CO2 footprint of it? What is your uptake? Did you manage to put all the CO2 in the rock to, to actually uh, achieve the numbers you need to do, because that drives a business case for us? Then the volume that you can produce, how you're going to size the first-of-a-kind plant, how big do you want it to be, and then over which time frame do we offtake the material. And for time frame, we had this as a side conversation in preparation, actually. Just thinking of how long do you actually want to operate first-of-a-kind plants really depends on what you want to prove. If you just want to prove something, th something technically and you're chill still charging a green premium for your product, that's probably not something you will want to operate for a long time. It's more about proving out the demand, proving out the market, and proving out the, all the technicalities and engineering. If your first-of-a-kind plant runs at a positive IRR at commodity prices, which is, I think, the basis for climate technology, it needs to be at cost parity, then these off agreements could go a long time into the future because it's very good business. Yeah, and you mentioned green premium, which is uh, another interesting topic for first-of-a-kind commercial scale facilities. Um, does a first-of-a-kind commercial scale facility have to produce the product at market parity prices? Or how do you, how do you think about green premium as a buyer? Um, at, at scale, I'll be very blunt, there is no green premium for commodities. And you can talk to many different buyers in many different markets, it doesn't really make a difference. There is no green premium. So when you size your first-of-a-kind plant, what do you want to prove out? Again, if you're hitting commodity scale sizes, you have to be price competitive. If your goal is to prove out a market, and I think their building materials are something special because we're in new standards, we're in new chemical compositions, that the concrete that we're then pouring in job sites is something difficult, is something very different, you need to prove out the market, you need to prove out the demand, you need to see that it works, and for that, people do pay, pay a premium if at the other end of the premium there is a successful long-term business case for, for the material in itself. So, it goes hand in hand, at scale, it has to work at commodity prices, that's for sure. So what you're saying essentially is that you buy access to a cost curve, in a way. You're fine to potentially pay a little bit more in the near term just to be able to gain priority access to the product at then commodity prices from the next plant and the next plant and the next plant in your key markets. Exactly, and I think maybe this is a little bit the, the ethos with Maker Ventures as, as part of Holson that we, we try to have is we're trying to get a competitive advantage out of it for the group. So we combine the equity investment, which we did in your Series A, with these commercial agreements like offtakes and, and commercial partnerships to secure the longer-term competitive advantage for us. Does that mean we have to pay a green premium at smaller scale in the beginning to get access to a product? Yes. Do we acquire the customers at the back of that? Also yes. If we have a price competitive product in the long term that differentiates us from our customers and in the end, gives us a long-term competitive advantage. So we, we try to wrap all of this in a win-win situation where we have in, uh, aligned incentives, we participate in the same cap table, we want to make the business scale and grow, and if everything works out well, your company grows, we solve the climate problem, and also Holtzum gains a competitive advantage. So. And very interestingly there, before you sign an offtake agreement with, with a company like us, or us, of course, uh, very soon. Um, what do you do ahead of that? How do you make sure that there is actually demand for this, for this product? Do you go to your customers and sign offtake agreements with them first? 
that's that's the ideal case, right? And at scale, that's something that that you will do because you're taking risk for many tens of millions or hundreds of millions of demand when you're building a building a plant of such a size. So you try to lock in the demand for yourself as well. It's part of de-risking any industrial project. On the smaller scale, you try to find pilot customers and early adopters on the private sector and the public sector that you can really address the, the, the material to. So for the offtake that we, we procure, we have a market that we know absorbs this in the projects and kind of the scale that we're, that we're acquiring the, the offtake for to say put it to work. In the end, if it's a premium product, then probably we're, we're not making a massive margin on the, on the projects. But we gain experience and we gain the customers to, to really do that. And I think some, some aspect of this, and, and I think maybe then it's something to throw over to you, is the offtake and how you structure it and so on is one building block to make a first of a kind happen. But there are many other things that need yeah. to fall in place to, to build it. So besides the offtake, mm. when you think of your first of a kind, what do you think you're gonna, gonna have to do? So first of all, there's offtakes on both sides, right? So there's the customer offtake, which in our case would be you signing a purchase agreement for the material, but to be able to be believable and trustworthy in being able to come through with that actual material delivery, we need to sign an offtake agreement with our material suppliers as well. So you're kind of ending up with this cascading set of offtake agreements across the value chain. Especially when you consider that you have ones with your customers, we have one with you, we have one with our suppliers, they have it with their suppliers. So there's a whole you know, um, nice little sandwich table of offtake agreements that you put in place first. Well then, for us to finance the, the plants, of course, how we use these offtake agreements is in creating comfort with project financiers, with banks, um, with debt providers, who then gain comfort in the business case. Uh, of this plan so that we don't have to finance all of it with, with equity. There are some clean tech companies that have financed their first of a kind commercial scale facilities purely with equity. It's very expensive for the startup. You have to give up a lot of your, your company to raise enough capital for that. But it is an option if you don't manage to secure project financing. Now, uh, the offtake agreements are really the cornerstone that have to come in place so that you can secure financing for your first of a kind commercial plans and then you have to build it. And of course, there's a bunch of other steps involved, like choosing the best location for it, which also goes hand in hand with the off agreement. Where do you find the demand for your product? So you can optimize for logistics. Mm -hmm. Same thing for your feed that comes into the, into the process. Also, location matters there as, as well. And by the way, there's also off agreements, but maybe for logistics solutions, from moving the product into our plant and then over to, to your plant. Um, yeah, there's really a lot that's, that goes into it. But it sounds like you got a lot of this figured out already. You're still partnering with us, with us so <laughs> in the end, why, why do you think you need us in the whole thing? You can give us a big deal uh, <laughs> and be a large buyer and a large, large customer. Uh, we can accelerate how we can go to market uh, with, with you guys or how fast we can enter different categories in the construction sector. And you're really nice people, uh, which was a nice, uh, nice bonus on, on this end. Um, I have another, the, uh, one final question before we, before we wrap up. Maybe let's see if we have time for one, one rapid fire round as well. But should, because you're going to verify the demand for the offtake agreements with your customers. Should we keep going to your customers to then come to you to show that, look, there is demand mm -hmm. for this type of products? It's a, it's a tricky situation, mm. but I think talking about kind of the message that you need to send through the value chain, it's something that cannot be done alone. You have, to, you have to collaborate, you have to tell the story together, you have to approach new customers with a, a unified message, which then I think also kind of helps at least them move the first step. So doing it separately and doing it together both has its, its benefits. But the problem is so big that I think no one can, can solve it on their own. And especially for the first of a kind, we're going to do you need to do some convincing with people, and that's best done together. Exactly. Looking forward to doing that. Yes. I think we're, we're right on time, so we will, we will wrap up here. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Andreas.